my name is Sean Donaldson and I'm the museum educator at the African American Museum of Iowa. Before we get started with our panel discussion today, I just wanted to introduce you to the museum and to our panelists. The African American Museum of Iowa was founded in 1993 by a small group of members of the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church who noticed that African American history and culture were underrepresented in school curriculums and decided to do something about it. Uh, after time in a church building and a shopping mall, the AMI led a successful capital campaign and built our permanent location in 2003. Since then, we have continued to offer uh, our services guided by our mission to preserve, exhibit, and teach the African American heritage of Iowa. Uh, today, we are excited to begin our 1619 Project panel series. The 1619 Project is an ongoing initiative from the New York Times Magazine that began in August 2019, the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery. It aims to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of Black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. As our own continuation of the project, we'll be hosting panel discussions on important topics in history and our daily lives. Each panel discussion will feature a variety of community voices, and in many cases, those voices will be Cedar Rapids or Eastern Iowa's own experts on the topics being discussed. Tonight's topic is music, specifically whether African American music has been culturally misappropriated. At this time, I'd like to introduce our voices for the evening. Uh, serving as our moderator and conversation starter for this and all of our 1619 panels is Mr. Carl Cassell. Uh, Carl received his education in Iowa, graduating from Iowa State before moving to the East Coast and eventually returning to Iowa. He has spent most of his professional life working in nonprofit and or government settings, serving underrepresented communities from Maryland to Iowa and has served as the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission and president and CEO of Horizons, a family service alliance. Carl is also a former managing partner at Top Rank Executive Recruiting, a firm he and other forward-thinking individuals formed to help stem the employment gap with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. So thank you for joining us, Carl. My pleasure, thank you. Our first panelist is Mr. Myron McReynolds. Myron was educated in Illinois, uh, graduated from Western Illinois University, first with a bachelor's in music education and later with a master's in music education. Uh, Myron has led numerous high school and collegiate band programs, the most recent being City High School in Iowa City, has led community bands, regional, national, and international tours, and has served as an adjudicator and clinician for a number of festivals. Uh, today, he is the Director of Education at Orchestra Iowa, where he oversees outreach programs, area collaborations, and all activities of the Orchestra Iowa School. Uh, thank you for joining us, Myron. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Damani Phillips. Dr. Phillips was educated at DePaul University in Chicago, the University of Kentucky, Wayne State University, and ultimately earned his Doctor of Musical Arts degree in Jazz Studies at the University of Colorado at Boulder, becoming one of the first African Americans in the country to do so. He is an active performer, pedagogue, composer, and academic scholar who has taught and performed throughout the US, Europe, Asia, and South America. He currently serves as Director of Jazz Studies and Associate Professor of African American Studies at the University of Iowa and has published numerous recordings as well as a book titled What Is This Thing Called Soul? Conversations on Jazz and Black Culture, which delves into the difficult topic of the decline of Black cultural influence and representation in jazz as traditionally taught in academic spheres. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Phillips. Thanks for having me. And our last but not least panelist is Mr. Blake Shaw. Blake Shaw is a double bassist, vocalist, band leader, teacher, and a composer and arranger from Lisbon, Iowa, who has resided in Iowa City for the last 10 years. Blake was educated in Iowa, uh, received a degree from Kirkwood Community College, as well as a Bachelor of Music in Classic Double, classical, excuse me, double Bass Performance, and a Master's of Art in Jazz Composition and Performance uh, degrees, both from the University of Iowa. Uh, Blake now teaches music to young children at the Cedar Rapids and Hiawatha Day Schools during the week and plays anywhere and everywhere every single weekend in and around the Midwest. Blake is also a member of the Iowa City Jazz Fest's talent picking team. Uh, thank you for joining us, Blake. Thank you for having me. Uh, with all of our panelists introduced, I will now turn it over to Carl Cassell, who will lead our panel in our discussion on whether African American music has been culturally misappropriated. Take it away. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, panelists, um, for uh, taking the time to discuss uh, this topic. And I want to start out with the question, um, and from your perspective, do you think 
um, African American music has been culturally misappropriated. Um, why or why not? Misappropriated. It. This is a a, a a tough line to toe, but I think that the fact that this um, accusation is floating around is absolutely real, um, and that there is some at least some level of validity to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we look back through the history of African Americans in this country, um, mainstream America has helped itself to the people and products of African American existence for hundreds of years. And it it's, seems to reason that that would not stop at artistic products. In fact, I'd say perhaps it even intensifies there. There seems to be a kind of feeling or a sense of entitlement to those things to do with as you see fit and manipulate as you, you know, as you deem appropriate without there being any kind of sense of a need to answer or acknowledge the source and the creativity and the energy that goes into creating such things. So, you know, this, the fact that this conversation is happening um, and I guess we'll have a conversation here with, of course, for this panel discussion as to how valid that uh, argument is. But the fact that we are having it is definitely not something that's imaginary. It's due to something that's very, very real and very, very present in the American psyche and how America uh, deals with African-American personhood and deals with the cultural and social and economic products that African-American culture contributes to this country. Wonderful, mm -hmm. thank you. Anyone else want to jump in and add to that? Well, I would just, I would tend to agree. Um, I do think that sometimes when you talk about misappropriation, especially of an art form like music, which exists in the air, uh, we have to be careful um, to not uh, be incorrect in letting something misappropriation when it is simply appropriation, for example. Uh, in other words, when an artist, a musician, presents his or her music, uh, the expectation is that others will listen to it, use it, copy it, record it, and so on. That necessar doesn't necessarily mean it's misappropriated. But I certainly do believe that the culture, the style, uh, the persona, if you will, of the, of the musician can be misappropriated and certainly has been uh, throughout history and persists till today. Thank you. Yeah, well said. <laughs> I agree with all that so far. Okay, yeah, well, we'll go to our, our next question. Um, how, would you def how would you attempt to define music made by Black Americans? And, uh, Mr. Shaw, please, you can start out. How would you attempt to define music made by Black Americans? I think, I think back to uh, every century and uh, the, what draws it all together is, is the soul. But I, to me, I can always tell when, uh, not always, but most of the time I can tell when an African American is, is playing music, and especially singing, just the the uh, um, the tradition of the the uh, blue notes that we use, and uh, the phrasing that has has come all the way down is is, is something special. Perfect. Anyone want to uh, piggyback on that? Well, I would say certainly. Um... Uh, elements of black music would be those things where you can probably trace back to slavery. The wails, the hollers, the moans, if you will, um, certainly improvisation at its core. Um, and I would say that um, the understanding and ability to, to um, suggest all of life in a sense in its entirety, the good, the bad, the ugly, and so on. Um, those are all things which come to us um, from uh, African American culture dating back to slavery. And again, I think as they are, um, as we see them in music of today and music throughout history, we certainly can, can understand that source. Yeah, to piggyback on that, um, you know, I end up having to think about this quite a bit in the classes that I end up teaching at at the um, at, at Iowa and to the best of my uh, 
comprehension. I, I think it boils down to this. No matter what kind of music you're talking about throughout the history of African Americans being in this country, it tends to have four things in common. Now, the wrapping paper in which all this comes may change to you know, manifest itself differently depending on times and cultural tastes and cultural cues and the state of African American culture at, at any given time. But at its core, we have these four things. The need to tell a story, to communicate something of personal consequence to the person who's listening. And while now we that happens by way of choice, we, you know, in the beginning of all this, this was, you know, this was done by virtue of necessity in trying to say things and communicate things that could not be openly communicated for you know, fear of retribution, you know, leading up to death, anything and anything in between, you know, leading up to that uh, to that level. Um, the second thing is emotional urgency and potency. This sense of investing yourself totally and fully into what it is that you're performing in a way that uh, uh, lends a kind of vulnerability uh, from, by virtue of you literally, you know, cracking open your chest and sharing exactly what it is that's in your heart. And the hope that people will, that people who are listening will feel that and pick up on that and connect with it. Uh, the third thing is a sense of individuality and authenticity of expression. This, uh, this sense of crafting the music in a way that is unique to you and that cannot be repeated by other by others in uh, in an exact way. Um, catering the music to be a complete and utter and accurate and authentic reflection of the person who's performing. And all those things are achieved by way of bending of the Eurocentric kind of conventions or the norms in the music. So instead of these rules and regulations that go along with our basic system of music, the performer is given the ability to bend uh, bend those norms really in the uh, in the interest of creating a an expressive kind of out outpouring of of music that is uniquely suited to the person performing it and uniquely suited to the moment in which that music is being performed. So all four of those things, I think, is no matter whether it's we're talking about spirituals, we're talking about work songs, we're talking about R&B, even if we're talking about hip hop, I think that those four things tend to be at their very core, regardless of what era and the you know and the historical development of the nation that we're talking about. Could you tell me number four again of of, of your four points? Yeah, bending of the Euros Eurocentric conventions or norms in music. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That, that's good. Okay. It's perfect. And so we, we talk about those genres of music, and this is for any of you panelists. Um, and, and, and I love the four points, the telling the story, the emotional urgency, the sense of individual, individuality, and bending the Eurocentric, uh, Eurocentric norms. Um, what, post-slavery, how do we see those uh, uh, points, uh, those four points, shaping music over the course of the last three to four hundred years, and and with and, and with that, and with it being shaped in that vein, um, are we telling our story? Is our story being heard um, uh, accurately, or is someone else helping to shape the story that is interpreted from our music? And that's I definitely important. think there is uh, a, a little, a little bit of both, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so there, at that time when uh, slaves were being freed, they were uh, able to uh, get more materials and, and you know, instruments and 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 ways to uh, travel uh, to 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 really play their music to audiences, and. Um, but of course, uh, the, uh, there was people holding them back still. So uh, they're uh, on, a, in a, on a certain level, of course, their, their story wasn't being presented the way that they wanted it to be, mm -hmm. but it definitely had been, was going in the right direction. Thank you. Good, thank you. Anyone else? I don't know. I think that we, in the beginning, here's the deal. There's always a, a method or a system of control which is uh, functions as like a chokehold 
on mm -hmm. the free flowing of that of that narrative or those stories. Um, and you know, the need to make those, you know, that communication covert instead of, you know, out in the open. There's always some mechanism of control that is, you know, be it directly or indirectly controlling the flow of what is and isn't heard. And that, you know, that's all the way from day one of slavery all the way up until, you know, now with the record industry and there being someone in a boardroom somewhere deciding what is appropriate or inappropriate to release as it, you know, and what's going to be marketable. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact that we have like underground hip hop and underground hip hop tends to be the stuff that carries social and cultural commentary. But if you're talking Absolutely. about, you know, something that's completely, you know, innocuous and, you know, irrelevant, that magically becomes a, you know, something that's pushed and becomes a national hit. There's always some mechanism of control that is that's steering the you know steering the kinds of narratives that are that are decided to be put out there as and deemed or heralded as important, and we can't ignore that. You know, if it was a, literally a free market where anyone could, it, it'd be one thing, but it's, it's kind of not. And you know, I think that in contemporary society, the internet has leveled the playing field a bit, and that anyone from anywhere can. You know, in your basement, you can make music and say what you have to say, and it's actually a, a fighting chance of it getting out to the, you know, to the masses. But, you know, that hasn't always been the case, and you've always, many people have been dependent on a company or some type of, you know, uh, level of administration to decide that your music is worthy of being released. And many times that has not included African American, an African American presence. It's been a company ran by, you know, white Americans, and white Americans making decision on what's you know, good or bad music uh, from African American culture. So you can't ignore the presence of that. That's and that absolutely is a factor all the way through. Though the level, the playing field is being leveled now, it hasn't always been that way. And until we get into the soul era, we don't really have a, a concentration of African American owned record companies who are making decisions on what gets released and what doesn't. And that was went until the 1960s. But to that point, you were always at the whim of someone who had did not have a vested interest in the cultural uh, kind of messaging that you're trying to share. I agree, but I, I do think there has always been an attempt to do that. Um, if you think uh, of sort of immediately following slavery, uh, groups like the Fist Jubilee Singers, who took the sounds of the, the slaves in the fields and packaged in a way which they wanted to present to the world. It was received sometimes very well, sometimes not so well, but certainly there was an attempt to say, this is our music, this is our culture, this is what, this is the way we want it to be seen and or heard. Um, if you look at jazz, there's an expression that, of music, which I mean, you can say is uniquely African-American. Uh, it wasn't always uh, accepted. There were certainly difficulties in marketing and putting the music out there, but as a form of self-expression, to saying this is who I am and this is how I want to express myself. I think there have been times throughout history where even with the constraints of quote the system of those who are in control, there has always been an attempt to have my music heard and the expression may have gone out, maybe not be very well received or very well marketed, but the expression, the self-expression by the musician, by the artist, I think has always been there and continues to be there. You know, if may I, re may I reply, is that okay? Please. You know, I, I, um, I agree with you that there's always been an attempt, but you know, in the, for instance, the Fist of Jubilee Singers, what, are, what did they have to do to the music in order for it to be an attempt? You, they essentially had to package it in a way that reflected European classical music in order for it to possibly kind of sort of be conceived as palatable to the American, to mainstream mm -hmm. American public. And so, and along the way, strip out a lot of those elements that made it uniquely, conclusively African American. So that's what I mean by this system. There's some mechanism there that has to be overcome. So yes, you're giving, you're putting something out there that comes, that's connected to African American culture, but mm -hmm. it ha largely has to surrender many of the things that give it its unique identity in doing so. So let me let me piggyback on some of what you guys were just saying. I want to talk about jazz, for instance, because jazz, for a, a, a small period of time, kind of found its lane, and they were able to produce the music that they wanted 
and 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 how it was felt. Um, I don't know if that has over the course of the last 400 years trickled into other genres of music, but would we say there was a golden age where we could put out the music we wanted, how we wanted, the way we wanted? And why or why not? I'll let somebody else go first. I don't want to bring okay. it down. Hogs the mic. <laughs> Well, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if there's ever, ever been a time when, uh, as Imani had spoken to, right, we, we had that ability to literally say, this is what we want to do, and it went out in the way we intended and the purpose we intended. I think there are probably times when it's been, you know, uh, when jazz was the, the popular music, for example. Um, there is always white influence in that. But if you could look at some of the performers who did make a name for themselves, let's say Duke Ellington, for example, he was popular. Uh, he was well received. There are certainly constraints on what he could do, and certainly when it came to recording and, and, and making money, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there probably was a time when we could say that jazz in particular was certainly the popular music of the day. And to the extent that it was African American and that and that improvisation, that soul, that personality was able to come through, then you might say that that might be a golden age. That a golden age, even as Damani said, I would agree, always had some constraints, however. Well, you know, um, yeah, I don't think there's ever been, I agree with Myron, there's never been really a golden age. There have been waves of times where we were, those African-American influences ended up winning out as the thing that was prevalent. Mm -hmm. But even in those short bits of time where that happens, there's constantly, a, if you think about, since you brought up jazz, you think about the history of jazz since the beginning. It's always been a bit of a tug of war. There's, you know, this African-American music, and then there's a white band that brings it out first, you know what I mean? And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then we start to see jazz being assaulted, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's a poor word choice, started to be um, uh, appropriated by the classical side of things, and you see it popping up in mm -hmm. orchestral pieces, and then you see big band come along, and there are bands, you know what I mean, that, you know, we have... Duke Ellington and Basie, but then we also have like the Paul Whiteman Orchestra where a lot of those elements of the music that are conclusively African-American are completely stripped away. And now this is somehow deemed to be a more dignified version of jazz mm -hmm. that is appropriate for, you know, the society scene. You know, but the mm -hmm. stuff that those, you know, black musicians are making and those black composers are creating is unsophisticated, you know, um, uh, you know, unrefined music. There's always been a tug of war, and then you get the bebop where, you know, African-American sensibilities went out. Then you get cool jazz right after that where the, you know, the African-American aesthetic is largely stripped away. Then you get soul jazz where the black aesthetic is back and forth. You get what I'm saying? There's always this tug of war. And so we never, it never quite settles in like, okay, this is black music and the black aesthetic is how it's going to be. And if you want this to be, you know, if you choose this to be the kind of music you want to focus on, it needs to reflect that. It never quite wins. It never quite settles in because it's the commercialist side of it. You yeah. I mean? and, e and even when the music wasn't necessarily appropriated, sometimes the... For example, um, early jazz, um, there was a group called the Original Dixieland Jazz Band, right? right. A white so um, Nick LaRocca, the coordinators in the band, was known to say, especially as he traveled through Europe, when people were really catching on to this music, it became almost a world music. Right. He was noted as saying, well, uh, when, when, it was, when people would ask where this comes from, is this Black or African American music or Negro music? His reply was absolutely not, because we know that Blacks aren't smart enough or skilled enough to have done this, you know, to have invented this. So even when the music, in a sense, was coming through as we might think it should for that era, that style, the, the whole idea of, of the blackness of it, the originality of it, was misappropriated and put down. So even though it was a popular music and it was jazz, it wasn't, it wasn't we weren't giving credit for it. And, and I think that's, those sorts of things have always been there. Yeah, that's at the core of it. Give credit where credit is due. Right. And and mainstream America is wholly uh, 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 resistant to that idea. Yeah. And that's why I say to me, misappropriation is less an action than an intention. 
So it's not so much what we do, it's why we do it, what we do it and how we tell the story. Do we give credit? Those sorts of things is where, the, where misappropriation has always been there and continues to be. Blake, did you want to add anything? Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I, I would just, I agree with that. I haven't, I can't think of an era where uh, we've been able to express ourselves the way we wanted it. It's definitely easier nowadays to, to find the corners of the internet. And, and, and you know, the first thing that comes to mind is black Twitter. I don't know if anybody else is uh, mm -hmm. familiar with, with that part of Twitter, but just uh, being a part of that community makes it easier to bring it in. But, uh, but I'm living in this era, so I, I can, I can uh, talk about it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. yeah, the technology has had an impact. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that is a perfect segue um, uh, to kind of come up to the current, and, and we'll go back, but I, but I want to stay uh, uh, here for a moment, the technology. Um, uh, earlier it was stated about underground hip hop, which I've always been a fan of and stayed away from a lot of the mainstream hip hop because the underground at least spoke to the, conscious, the consciousness of what was happening. But how has the technology either uh, hindered or uh, um, helped to cultivate the message that black music wants to put out. And because the technology has now become mainstream that's being used, how has that also been used to counter the message um, in, in some ways? If it's okay, I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah. I think it, it works two ways. It's a double-edged sword. One, it makes it possible for those who are not financially affluent and that have gone through, you know, have the money or the time or the wherewithal to go through all kinds of training, gives them the opportunity to create music and put and get their music out there without the need to go through a record company. But at the same time, uh, the problem is that hmm, it's the best way to put this. <laughs> Anyone and anybody can do it now. Yeah. <laughs> and so the 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 broad the, the the bandwidth gets very congested with stuff that you mm -hmm. have to kind of peel through to get down to those things that are you know legitimately connected to something of consequence um, yeah and yeah i think i'll I'll stop there, but yeah it's a like i said a double edged sword, but at the same time you know it it offers opportunities to people that you know otherwise would not have them. And it also lets us sidestep this need to be for what you have to say to be co-signed on by someone. You know? I, I also think that one of the benefits is that um, it, you don't have to create a music which necessarily is, is marketable to the masses. In other words, if you have a story to tell and you don't mind telling it to what I might call a niche audience, you can certainly do that and that exists. The downside, of course, to much of this is that financially it's not going to be very, uh, you know, you don't make money at it, right? There's, there's often no money involved. Um, but you can sort of get your story out, uh, find, you know, a relatively small audience who may follow you. And if, if, that's, if that's okay, you know, if, if that's what you're looking for, it can, it can happen. Yeah, uh, I think it. Uh, we, we're each talking about uh, the good and the, and the bad part about it, and it's kind of the same. Where that, um, there's a lot of people that probably wouldn't even be able to find their audience without uh, the technology that we have yep. today. Um, it, 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 you know, depending on where you live, maybe jazz isn't uh, popular where you are, but you really love playing it, and you know, to get your music out there, yeah, the social media has definitely been there. You know, there is a term in hip hop and it says the streets is watching. Yes. What that means is that if you are out there, you are put forward as somebody who is a leader in this art form. You had to forge your, you had to sharpen your steel by virtue of the people in your community. At which point you are then now anointed being worthy or ready to be out there as a representation of the voice you know what I mean, of your individual community. Mm -hmm. You know, this technology thing lets people completely sidestep that. And yeah. I think that there is a, um, that's a, a natural, off, you know, organic system of vetting that has, works well, has worked well for the music because 
you had you know you had to earn your keep you had to earn your respect before people would accept what it is you had to say as something that is a you know authentic reflection and i know people nowadays don't like to hear that you know you're not ready you can't do something but on the other hand you know the quality and the you know what i mean the potency of your voice makes a difference in how that's received and the potency and how it's you know uh, um, internalized by the people who are listening and if there's so much of it out there just willy-nilly people tend to tune it out so now you have to magically find a way to peel through that to get to an audience that you know to you know to to have your message be conveyed to an audience that wants and needs to hear it but it's hard look at pandora man if you try to you know what i mean the stuff you have to sift through to get down to something that you actually did you'll yeah, be there for a minute before it comes in you know what I mean? it's just the reality it's of the story days. and it's difficult when you don't have enough people that want to do the digging as well so so many people are just turning spotify and pandora and youtube on and mm -hmm. just letting it go and you know like we were saying willy-nilly just plays yeah, there's a lot of a widespread taking of music for granted mm -hmm. on a number of different and, levels and an entitlement too. Absolutely. So with the modernization of, as we look at the Pandoras and the Spotify's and the Apple Music, they're, they're helping to monetize uh, whatever genre music, but for Black America, again, we're looking at a, a system that still only allows... Uh, a few hand-picked artists to represent the culture. Um, how do we, how do we do away with that? Because again, now it's telling a story, um, uh, uh, a progressive story of Black America that might not still be totally accurate. How how do we uh, 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 change that monetization of still a small fraction of the entire Black experience? I think you need people to want it. I, it there's nothing that, uh, uh, there are so many rich and powerful people that uh, are in a smaller group that I want, want to control uh, what everybody sees and until the actual real people are listening, until they let someone know somehow that, that this is what they want, that nothing's gonna change. You know, people, like you were saying, Damani, like people are too used to just being handed, handed to us, like uh, not, not going digging for it. Well, what's the best way to, to put this? Um, can I, if I may tell, share a story. I, I wrote a book. Please. In 2000, I wrote a book in 2015 and put it out. And I interviewed a, a jazz musician named Nicholas Payton in that book. Um, very outspoken, you know what I mean, guy about this very issue that we're talking about here, very sharp tongue. And in that interview, he said something to me at the time I flat out didn't believe. He said, you know, Damani, in 2015, uh, on the Hot 100 charts on Billboard, there was not a single black artist. And, you know, at this point in time, hip hop dominated the entire chart. I think of that year, there were 11 um Take that back. There were 11 number one tunes over the course of that year in every genre, and like seven or eight of them were hip hop tunes. And mm. I thought that this guy was crazy. And so I went and dug up the information, and he was absolutely correct that of those eight, seven, or eight hip hop tunes, they were all white male hip hop artists. <laughs> Wow. And he said, at that point, he said, this is the first time that it ever happened since hip hop had, you know, started to chart. And he said, at that point in the game, we were no, no they no longer needed black people to, to do be a part of black music. He was like, yeah. it's official at that point. It was like Macklemore and, you know, Robin, uh, was it Robin? Uh, Robin Thicke. Yeah. Is it Robin Thicke? Is that his name? Or is that his, that's the yeah. father? Well, that's him. Oh, maybe, yeah, it might be his father, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he got sued for the Blurred Lines tune. It was the year that that came out. It was official mm -hmm. at that point. He was like, man, at that point, uh, wow. America no longer needs black musicians to play black music. And it's been in, in going in a similar direction ever since. And I think the secret to that is that we need to, um, we need to channel our dollars into music that speaks our story. Mm -hmm. That's there's enough of us. There's enough of us in terms of population for us to be just fine, but we have to point our dollars towards music that reflects our experience. 
and away from those things that don't. I don't mean that in an exclusionary way, but I do mean that most many communities do that. They point their dollars towards, you know, their own communities as a means of sustaining themselves. You know what yeah. I mean? Except for African American, what do they say? The, uh, the average dollar stays in the African American community about four or five minutes before it's, nope. it goes to someone else. Yeah, nope. right. Absolutely. That's the secret, but we don't we don't do that. Again, taking things for granted, as Blake said. That's. So so let me, you bring up a great point as we talk about um, how Billboard um, and hip hop has even changed, but let's take it back um, and then bring it uh, uh, forward again. So we look at white performers performing in blackface. Now they don't have to put on blackface, but they can perform black music and make more money. I think of Eminem, the fact that so many people call him the goat of hip hop and, and, and for me, knowing I grew up on the Red Mans, the Wu Tangs, the Rock I would, I, I think it's crazy to call this guy the best lyricist in hip hop. So now they don't need to put on blackface, but they have the black ink and, and you know, uh, all the mannerisms and all the things that go into it. So uh, we had blackface before, white performers putting on blackface. Now they're just doing black music. How do we? get away from that again as we at one point got away from blackface or did it just kind of uh, 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 reconvene in it being uh, white performers performing black music? How, how, do we, how do we rid the industry or at least our music of that sort of stigma? Well, I, I don't know, but for me, I, I don't know that it's ever gone away. Um, for me, right. Um, we look at, uh, if you look historically black at, at, back at minstrelsy, we had whites in black face. Um, we could get upset about, in a sense, the way they portrayed blacks um, and the things that they did. But to me, the, the greater sin, if you will, is that for the country, they defined what blackness was. Um, and I don't know that that has ever changed. And so as long as others are defining what our culture is, what the black culture is, they are free to take, pick, choose, change, alter, promote, whatever, whatever they, they choose to do. And to me, that's, that's, like I say, the greatest sin because I think it endures. Uh, we can, you know, we we can get, we have time passes in the blackface, the, the makeup is no longer there. But what, you know, that defining of a culture and, and putting us in whatever box we want to put us in and, and saying what is good and what is appropriate and, hey, look, that's what black music is and that's what, you know, is, as long as that is there, and I think that endures till today, so I'm not sure minstrelsy has ever really gone away in the way that I feel it was it was most hurtful. Yeah, it's like racism. It it's it's still alive, well, and kicking. It just manifests itself in different Absolutely. ways. It evolves as our culture and our society evolves. Um, while you brought up Eminem, I will say this for him. Um, yes, he is a, a white rapper in hip hop and a music genre that's distinctly African American. But I give him credit for the fact that that man never, ever, ever was hesitant to acknowledge what he was doing and where it came from. And not Absolutely. everybody does that. Let's go ahead and call it like it is. That, and that's sure. part of, that's really the offense. Sure. As Myron was saying earlier, that's where you cross that line and it's called appropriation. When you act brand new, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You, you Like what you're doing does not <laughs> emanate from something that's other than what you come from. You know what I mean? Iggy Azalea, for instance. You know what I'm yep. saying? Or, or yep. An Australian woman, yep. a white woman who's acting brand new and wants to argue with Q-Tip about what hip hop is. Yeah. <laughs> that's Obvious. not a good yeah. idea. You know, <laughs> that man is it's a bad legend. Idea. Yeah. yeah, but but yeah. so what's important that we acknowledge that if somebody that man acknowledges exactly what he's doing and where he comes from, and he is technically speaking, sure. he is literally one of the illest guys on the planet. But he has studied this yeah, crap really down to the letter. Yeah. You know what I mean? He said, if I'm gonna yeah. do this, I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go all out. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to you know light stages on fire with what I'm spitting. You know what I mean? And right. to his credit, that's the right thing to do. Right. Sure. You know what I mean? That's but right on the, 
And there's nothing wrong. I don't see anything really wrong with that. It was like me um, when I was I was exclusively a classical musician for many years before I changed over to be a jazz musician. And so in a sense, I'm playing music that has nothing to do with my culture. And I played it pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. But there was a very clear system in place to make sure that I was perpetually acknowledging where, they had, where that came from. Absolutely. At, at every single turn. There was no way that I could say, hey, I'm going to be playing this, you know, this Rachmaninoff piece, but I'm going to play it like I'm, you know, but this, this is, I'm playing like I, like I came up in a church, you know, I'm going to play it like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and respecting the customs yeah. and the traditions of Absolutely. the European approach to performance. And I'd never, ever, ever tried to act like, oh, no, that's black music. That would be ridiculous. Right. And I could see every single professor in the building, you know what I mean, aiming their rifles at me, ready to have a, ready to take yes. issue with me if I tried it. Do you get what I mean? I but know. it's the lack of reciprocation that's the problem. We don't get that mm -hmm. same you know, respect and common courtesy and acknowledging return to us. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by, you know, mainstream America helping itself to those artistic products started out with us as people and helping themselves to the labor mm -hmm. that we produced. You know what I mean? And so it's the same situation, you know, decade after decade, century after century, it just manifests itself differently to fit the, mm -hmm. the, the changing context in which it's all going down. Mm -hmm. Can I interject with a question? Um, yeah. As we're talking about guys like Eminem and thinking of other genres, I play bass in my free time and that's a cool thing that I like to do. And then kind of, you know, try and study who else is playing and what they're doing. And I wonder what the philosophy is, what the thought train is when we're talking about white artists kind of stealing this hip hop music, thinking of the guys behind them, right? The, the studio guys or the musical directors who are often bass players. <laughs> One example that comes to mind is like Adam Blackstone, who's this tremendous bass player, arranger, who ends up behind all these big pop names like Justin Timberlake. So every time you see these big tours with all these great musicians playing, Blackstone's driving that ship, but JT gets all that cred or fame or celebration. I mean, is there, I don't, I don't know what I guess I'm trying to ask, is there a way to correct that? How, how, would, how might we go about that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I don't know if it's on us to correct it, though. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Absolutely, it's, and I don't mean to insinuate that at all. I just... No, no, no. I'm with you. I get what you're saying, but that's on the artist. And I think that unless we do something, make different decisions that force them to address that, there's no reason or motivation for them to do anything different. There's no reason for Bruno Mars mm -hmm. to actually uh, shout back to Cameo. And you know what I mean? The Gap right. Band, in the music he made, it's, it, it's advantageous for him to act like he's a brand new, you know, creative artist who came up with something brand spanking new. That works to his financial benefit. But our historical recollection is getting shorter and shorter by the day. And that's working to the right. benefit of, you know what I mean, of, of, of companies and artists who are hopeful and praying that they, that, you know, the people who are buying their music have no idea who, who no idea who Cameo is. And it works, you know, and it works like gangbusters. I, I also think, though, um, in kind of the example that, that Sean brought up, um, I, I don't I want to say this. I think there's a place for, and I don't, I, I don't get upset with musicians who are background musicians, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you are comfortable it, that, you know, uh, presenting your art in that form as the backup basis to whoever it might be. Um, in other words, I don't know, we always have to be the star um, to understand where the overall music comes from. And the fact that you may be taking a back seat to someone else, a white artist, for example, um, I don't know that there's, there's something inherently wrong in that, if that makes sense. In other words, if, if, if I'm comfortable doing that and if I'm making the money and, you know, I don't maybe don't want the trappings which come, you know, with, with you know, the, the, the downside of being the star, for example, um, the fact you can walk down the street and not get mobbed, you know, maybe that's something you're still making the money. If that's something you want to do and you feel comfortable with that, I think that's okay. Um, so I, I don't know that we always have to push others to push make others push forward if they are comfortable in doing what they're doing contributing to whatever whatever artists are doing mm -hmm. 
but someone like myself, I'm, I'm in a lot of different avenues. I, I play with a lot of different types of people. And sometimes I, I want most of what I'm known for uh, to be the stuff that my name is on. So if I'm on a, if I'm a background musician on I, a genre that I don't really care for, uh, maybe I don't want my name out there on that genre. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. Having that choice of what you have your name on is, is important. That's true. But conversely too, I mean, there are instances where white artists have done the right thing from top Absolutely. to bottom in this. For instance, the Rolling Stones, you know what I mean? And them, yep. after they got huge, going back and getting Muddy Waters. Getting Muddy Waters, right. You know what yep. I mean? And, and, and I agree. bringing him out there and, 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 raise, and you know, raising his name up. Yep. That's respect. Got no problem with that. That's what, you know what I mean? That's just fair, fair, open acknowledgement of what it is that, you know, you rolled into yourself and it's part of your identity. And then yeah. acknowledging it fully in the ways that matter, not just in, not figuratively or symbolically, but in literal sense. But how infrequent is that though? Yeah. Where it's easier mm -hmm. to act like that doesn't, it's not a part of who you are and what made you what you are. Yeah. So panelists, Blake, Damani, Myron, um, so why did, so as we talk about the, uh, uh, the white artists painting their faces black or now kind of co-opting black culture to perform, we had black artists painting their face black for white audiences um, uh, uh, at a time in history. And now we have black artists today being, uh, playing the part of the worst black uh, 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 um, uh, image that white America is wants to believe that we are. How again? How do we dispel or break that chain? I'm, I'm sure just because they stopped painting their faces black, now they're still putting on another mask. Um, it's one in the same at some level. Um, what needs to be done to eliminate that sort of uh, 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 play on our own culture? Mm -hmm. It's, it's easier to hate, uh, it's easier to oppress people if they're all the same person. If they all look alike, if they all talk <laughs> the same, if, if, they all, uh, if they're all criminals or something, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it just makes it easier. And so I think getting away from uh, labels and record, record deals and using this uh, technology that is cheaper and easier to get a hold of and, and releasing your own stuff and your own image you know, no matter where you are is, is the only way out of that because the, the big rich people aren't going to do that for us. We have to do it. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a, a measure of, of importance in our self value too, and how we, the value mm -hmm. that we assess our culture to represent. Um, and, you know, a lot of times these things, you're, these very things you're talking about all result as a, you know, as a means of basically making a few bucks. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, you know, the promise that maybe you will have some financial gain from this allows you to turn your back on, you know, the integrity and the, and the, you know, the, the, you know, the reputation or the image that, you know, represents your culture. And, right. you know, so basically it's the, you know, the, the largest and most, you know, direct form of selling out that, that there is. And so you'll, you know, mm -hmm. many people will go along with anything. It's particularly if you're wrestling with, you know, financial issues in your day-to-day -day life, you know, you might be persuaded right. to do that. But it's mm -hmm. about us placing a value on ourselves that allow that lets us feel open and comfortable rejecting those kinds, those kinds of uh, moves. And right now we become mm -hmm. incredibly tolerant of it. And yes, we are. No, I, I agree. I think, Damani, you mentioned a long time ago, th th there are so many systems in place that have, that have hindered that voice from coming through. But I think in this case, that becomes incumbent on the individual, like you said. In other words, there may be money out there, but I will turn that money down for the sake of upholding my culture. Yeah. Uh, and so I think there is a place where in a sense, systems aside, it's up to the individual performer, individual artist, to make those decisions. You have to have a sense of self-worth or of cultural worth um, that, that allows you to, to maybe not be quite as famous or as rich. Um, and, and, and that's personal. 
And so I don't know that, in a sense, we can change that. Um, there, there are elements of anything that we do which are come down to us, you know, who we are and what, what we'll stand up for, what we'll take, what we won't right. take. And I, I think this, may, this is one of those times, one of those cases. Yeah, maintain a sense of integrity. Absolutely. You know? And um, by the way, this system of minstrelsy is another, you know, system of control. As you pipe those images of your own culture to people, you know, the people that you're making fun of. And over time, mm -hmm. they begin to believe that the validity of Absolutely. that. When I was young, right. they used to have cartoons on with Mammy on, you know, I mean, these very images that, you know, uh, we're looking at nowadays, like, what the hell? That was, that was <laughs> my Saturday morning. That was okay. all over my Saturday morning. And you, you know, you, you start to become accepting of that and start to view yourself right. through the lens of someone else's view, you know, stereotypical view of you. I yeah. remember when I was young, yeah. I would do things like call people African booty scratchers. You thought that was funny, you know what I mean? Or, or yeah, give, I was people grief for, <laughs> for give people grief yeah. because they had darker colored skin. This is that self-hate thing that, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't even realize that it filters down through. And that's not from no, that's not from out of the sky. That's a system that's been in place right. over the past hundred years that has taken root. Where we start to, you know, we start right. to express self-hate in these unhealthy ways. Yeah. All the way, you know, from us making poor choices in music, all the way up to us having, you know, issues with killing each other in, you know, in our neighborhoods. Yeah. It's, it's instilling these <laughs> seeds of, of, of self, um, you know, self-hate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you talk about the cartoons are out there. I, I'm older than you are. Uh, <laughs> I, I certainly remember, you know, a comedian, Pigmeat Markham. And this is, mm -hmm. he was in the 50s through the 60s and he was in blackface. And even today, uh, you know, I, I know I'll maybe shot down for this, but I'm not a fan of Tyler Perry nope, in much, what, in much of what he does. Because to me, that is exactly what he's doing. So, uh, you, yep. know, you know, to me, I said a long a while back that the thing that, that really bothers me about ministry is, is that it endures. And I think it endures even today um, in a variety of ways. And, and I, so I, I think that comes down to who we are as individuals and, and what we and the amount of integrity we have in who we are and, and our culture. Yeah. And our poor sense of cultural uh, memory, cult, you know, I mean, not culture, I'm sorry, uh, historical memory ends up coming back to bite us in the backside. Absolutely. Because yes, what does. happened 40 years ago might as well be, you know, something that happened in the age of the dinosaurs to many young people right now. Mm -hmm. We take information for granted, we take history for granted, and we are, as a result, we are doomed to see these things keep happening over and over again that seem like brand new occurrences, but they have, you know, this is the 10th iteration. It's like the Matrix or something. You yeah. know, this is, this right. is the 10th iteration of the Matrix. <laughs> you know, this has happened before. We just, yeah. there are, people are hoping that you don't know. Right. Um, after our conversations uh, today, it seems safe to state that in many ways, music can, can portray historical pain. Um, some artists like Amy Winehouse or Annie Lennox have found great fame performing music that has come from this pain as we talk about things like the blues. Would you agree? And what are your thoughts about this? Because um, you bring up that our music comes from uh, 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 this pain comes from telling a story of sometimes triumph, but triumph through the pain. Um, artists are, are, of course, monetizing this. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Well, as I tell my students, and I catch a little flack for it, but I don't care. <laughs> I say that when you're dealing with music that comes from this, you know, from, from our culture, you are literally playing feelings. Forget about those notes and all that stuff. You're playing feelings. You know, do you hate the person sitting next to you? Oh yeah, tell me what it sounds like. Do you, you know, do you want to go out tonight and you're antsy because you had a real long day and you're exhausted? Tell me what that sounds like. Fusing experience to the music is what gives it its vitality and what separates it from everything else that is happening. The fact that it not only is okay with you doing that, it actually thrives and much of its identity is folded into that very thing. That investing of self so intently, so personally that it simply cannot be duplicated by anyone else because no one else was walked in your shoes and no one else is feeling what you feel. Um, that's at the very core of it all. 
And when we forget that and we cast that need or that uh, tendency aside in the interest of making something that specifically is going to sell well in, in the current marketplace, I think we lose a part of the DNA of the music that that gives it, makes it special and makes it unique. And um, like just like in humans, if you pluck out a piece of a gene, you know, you you may have a, a being that looks something that's close to human, but it's not human anymore. It fundamentally is right. altered at the DNA level. I think the same thing is the case with music. Mm -hmm. When you pluck those genes out, it transforms into something else. Mm -hmm. And not saying that that transformation is a good thing or a bad thing necessarily, but more times than not, it's using it's, it's African American connection to as a as an asset for itself. Do you get what I mean as a means of furthering its its reach and furthering its appeal? So no, then it becomes a problem because you're taking advantage of the part of it that that uh, is profitable, that generates profit for you, but you're leaving behind those very core elements that identify it as exactly what it is. And then you have, then many people just choose not just to act like that's not, you know, that's not where it came from. Now we run across a point where we've, we've committed offense. And you shouldn't be angry if somebody opens up their mouth and says something against it. But you know, people feel like, oh, well, why are you targeting me? Well, because you just jacked some music that came from a culture that's not your own and you're acting brand new. <laughs> like you didn't just do that. Right. You know what I mean? Ask, right. you know, th that's where the problem comes in. And so now we're really trading on that appropriation line. You know, that's where the issue is. But it needs, it has an identity that's uniquely from us. And other people have enjoyed it, other people participate. But it, but it's important that we preserve the integrity of its very makeup, in order for it to live on, and in order for it to continue to be that conduit for those very, um, you know, personal feelings, those very personal experiences that are unique to the African American culture. And I, I would, I would dovetail on that, and and again, going back to something you said a while ago, Damani, and that the blues is at the root of of music, at popular music. I, I'll leave it that way. Yeah. But I, I, but in that, I think you also have to remember, you know, that that we think of the black experience as a painful one, and certainly there has been pain. But I think what maybe to me is most exciting about the black experience is that it wasn't always pain. In other words, African Americans weren't weren't bound by circumstance. There is happy music. You know what I mean? We can celebrate. We can cry. We can pray. We can do all of these things. So, so you know, the, the notion that, that music comes out of pain, sure it does, but it comes out of other things too. And I think we can find a Black experience in all of those things. And it expresses it not just in sadness, but in joy. And and I and I think that's that's something we, we, we can't forget. You know, the, the the notion is everything is bad. Yeah, circumstance is bad, but you don't have you don't necessarily take my soul. You can you can bind my hands and my legs, but you don't have to bind my soul. And I think what is wonderful about the African American experience is that that comes through in music that it's not always painful, it's not always sad, there is joy, there is hope, you know, all of those things come through. I mean, I, I really want to get any other reflections from uh, uh, the three of you um, that you would like to share, whether it be in the form of, uh, of an experience, a story, um, but as we look over the experience of Black music, or African American music in this country, um, where do you feel it's going? Do you feel it's in a good place? Um, uh, and, 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 and not just any specific genre of music, but just the experience of black music in this country. What, what are your thoughts and um, any experiences you'd like to share or thoughts you'd like to share on that? The music that's coming out is, is amazing. I, I don't know, it's, it's definitely not being hindered, but it, like we've been talking about, it's being used in a way that isn't uh, giving credit or, or due credit to, to the people that uh, pioneered it. And I think we just, it, it needs to be uh, more of a well-known thought to, to look further 
than the radio, you know, and, and, and look further than the, the name on the, the disc if you, if you buy mm -hmm. something like that. And, you know, it, with digital music and, and buying stuff online, we, it, ha it needs to be known that you should look a little deeper. Go Google who was on the record and, and see how it was made. I mean, if you like it, if you really love it, then it, it's only going to help you to know who made it or how it was made and, and stuff like that. And, and partly because of, of what I've done musically, you know, in, in my life, my life's work in a sense, and even where I am today. Um, I guess uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how I would say where music is right now, but what I would say is I would certainly hope that we can pursue enjoy, seek out uh, African-American music in a wide variety of genres or places. Um, I, I think one of the things that for me is, and, and I may be wrong in this, it's just kind of, you know, my own perception or my own take on things, is that sort of when we say black music, we go to hip hop. Not that there's anything right or wrong with that. I mean, that, but there is so much else. The black music experience was being produced. I mean, if you like classical music, you can find it. It is there. If you like jazz, if you like hip hop, if you like musicals, I don't know. But mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes we become tunnel visioned in, in a sense of where we look and what we expect or expect as for black music. I would like to see a more expansive understanding of the what I call the richness of African American musical output in a variety of genres. And that's true today and it has been that way historically. But we tend to have, kind of have this tunnel vision, this notion of there's a thread that runs from, from hip hop back to you know to to feel songs, slave songs. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. But all along the way, there are there's so much else going on, so much other, I many other things oh, we can shoot. find and we can enjoy. I, I kind of look at it as saying, I'm, I, you know, I want to see the United States. I want to get on Highway 30 and start out east and go all the way to the West Coast and stay on I, uh, Route 30, Highway 30. You can see an awful lot of America that way. But what you don't see is what lies 50 miles to the south or 30 miles to the north. And that's mm -hmm. all a part of it as well. And I, 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 I think that we miss out a lot um, as a culture, as a people, um, when, we, when we don't seek out the expansiveness uh, of what I would say is, is the African-American music, uh, music culture. And it's there historically and it's there today. Yeah. I think what well, well, thank you. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. Let, let me just jump in because I, that is really what I was getting to is probably a poorly uh, ask question, but do you see us getting a foothold, African Americans, in classical, in jazz, in gospel, um, um, in uh, 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 blues, in all the genres of music that, so our experience is not just pigeonholed into hip hop and R&B. So I, I appreciate uh, uh, that answer, uh, Myron, because that's what I was getting to, where we're going to see ourselves going forward based on where we are now. So I appreciate that. And if anyone else wants to add uh, uh, to that answer, I would uh, certainly love to hear it. Yeah, you know, um, African-American culture as a whole in the general sense has a bit of a habit. We, um, we will come up with things, uh, things like language, modes of dress, music, the country will latch on to it. You know what I mean? And then, mm -hmm. Uh, then we'll be like, oh, you know what? You can have that. We on to the next thing. You get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? There's been this endless yeah. flow of new innovative thinking. And right. instead of, you know, stopping to defend what it was you just came up with, we just move on to the next thing. And that's been our kind of our mm -hmm. MO. And I think we, but the problem with that approach is that one, you're not going to have an endless string of innovative thought and developments. And two, if you create something, right. you tend to uh, undervalue it and not 
separated from kind of those mundane things that you know come and go so things like the creation of jazz mm -hmm. you know what i mean or these pop these styles of music that have been so potent that they have reached every corner of the earth these are things that are worth stopping and preserving and supporting you get what i mean but if it's you look at that the same as you do baggy jeans back in the 80s and the 90s you know or something that you could do mm -hmm. without then you just you don't see any real value in it enough for you to stop and actually do any work or engage in the process of trying to defend the integrity and the identity of that. Absolutely. You know, I think I think we're at that point with you know not to go back to the to hip hop, but in in modern day that's the the prevailing voice. It's happening yeah. here again. You know what I mean? We're, we're wrestling yeah. with the same the same problem because we we tend to you know just move on to the next thing. But you know that's between jazz and hip hop, those are easily the you know some of the most uh, creative, innovative, and potent musical inventions on the planet in the past you know 150 years. It's permeating everything. When you turn on a commercial for Huggies and it's a hip hop song playing, you know what I mean? Go figure out. You gotta <laughs> just and, and just funny how this works. But in the 80s, there are people who were you know government people who were running campaigns to see that that music be shut down. Shut it down. <laughs> yeah. And it's literally permeates yeah. everything. On the insurance commercial, you got to, you know what I mean? It's, it permeates everything. Yeah. So I think we've reached a point now where we need to start to one, truly place value in those things that are emanating from the culture, all of them, not just hip hop, the ones that are more, you know, straightforward or, or clearly connected to African American culture, but those French things too. Celebrate our own culture and the products that come from it. And then two, we have to actually take action in supporting it. We tend to, you know what I mean? Our attention is, you know, focused in, you know, directions other than the stuff, the things that, you know, directly emanate from our culture. And if we don't support it, either other people are going to be left to support it or it dies. It's one of those right. two. If every, you know, if most people who come to see a jazz show are white Americans, hey, you, you, you crack open Pandora's box. Yeah, we're the ones keeping this afloat. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. how can you literally, you know, claim any ownership of something that I'm the one helping keep afloat? Yeah, so absolutely. we need to consider that place value in it, us ourselves as a culture, and most certainly those cultural products that emanate from our people. Yeah. Blake, anything uh, to close it up? Nope. That's good. Okay. Yeah, that, that that was excellent, gentlemen. I I so much appreciate it. We I could actually go for another hour, but um, <laughs> I've got to run out of questions, and I don't want to go back, be vacillating back and forth. But that was that was spot on. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. Well, I just wanted to say thank you from the museum uh, for all of you guys getting on and going through the reschedules and making this work in the world that we find ourselves in today. So thank you very much. Uh, for being here for all your insights thanks for the invite mm -hmm. yeah, this was a really great conversation <laughs>